again. It's good. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Tim. I really appreciate the chance to um, to give this talk. I, I really appreciate everything that Tim is doing relative to uh, the the CE Linux forum, and I think he's uh, just got uh, some tremendous things going on. So I, I really appreciate the chance to to speak. And yeah, it's true. I did get my start uh, around 1980, and as a kid. It was kind of amazing uh, to be at uh, university. I had this uh, uh, amazing chance to work on a VAX 11750. Um, you know, if you remember this, this was like the VAX MIP, right? The million instructions per second. This thing was running 4.2 BSD Unix, sorry, Unix, and uh, 12 meg of memory, and it was connected to the, the network, which in, in that era, about 1980, was UUCP, you know, dial up, you know, networking, basically. So. Uh, incredibly exciting as a kid to be able to get into the, the source code of the operating system without breaking into something or, you know, right, stealing it, right? That was like this amazing stuff. So I think for me that kind of motivated me to, to really do more with operating systems. And so um, that's kind of what I did. And, you know, I started working uh, for a couple of different companies out of school. And, you know, that VAX, it's amazing. We ran our entire computer science department on that one VAX with 12 meg of memory on it. Amazing. At Colorado State University. When I went uh, to work for Sequent Computer Systems, a server manufacturer, um, you know, similar sort of looking computers, big boxes that were one of the, uh, Sequent was one of the early uh, symmetric multiprocessing uh, companies. And so, uh, you know, we actually had 30 processors, 386s, 386s, you know, each about a VAX MIP, right, running on that, you know, big refrigerator looking thing and ran our entire company on it, right? Now, our top software guy was a guy, I didn't get his permission to use his name, so I, I shudder a little bit about saying it because I know what he can do to me if, if, if I were. But anyway, he, he was the top software, top OS guy at Sequin. And uh, he went to a security conference at one point in 1988 and got kind of interested in this idea of viruses. So with the permission of his manager, he created a very simple little virus. He wrote a little bit of code that would slip into some extra space in the a.out header, right? So you, it would not actually overwrite anything in the code. It circumvented the starting point, basically, of the binary. And then very simply would write a record to a file slash temp, giving the date and time, and the user, you know, oh, I, I got caught. And then it would run through dollar path, and you know, any executable it found that was uh, writable, it would just stick itself in that a.out header. Very simple. And then start the program. So you'd never know that it was infected, right? Classic virus in 1988, with the permission of his manager. And you know, he infected himself. You know, it's fine. And after a few days, you know, things were, you know, a low-level infection. And then, you know, somebody else got, oh, okay, ran one of his binaries. And so until the fateful day on November 2nd, 1988, uh, when, in fact, uh, somebody in the IT group who happened to be running his route happened to run one of the infected binaries, sure enough, every public binary in the system in that user's dollar path got infected. And so uh, load averages shot up. Everyone's productivity went to zero because the system was constantly pounding on that file and slash temp and then trying to go through all the dollar path and trying to infect everything it could, right? So everybody in the system essentially was infected at that point. And I, I, it, was, it was a fateful day because I remember his manager, a wild Australian, who I also won't use his name since he might get back at me too. But, you know, I remember him walking into Beck's, I mean, into that guy's office and he would say, disinfect, disinfect. You know, it was a great moment. Now, the reason why I remember it's November 2nd was because on that exact same day, uh, the internet came to a grinding halt. Now, it was not a big internet in 1988, but we were all, you know, dependent on it. Those of us who are a little bit older, you know, remember that day because November 2nd, 1988 was the date that the Morris worm got released. But all of us were saying, holy crap, Beck's virus got out to the internet. We've infected the whole world. What's happened? You know, it was like we were really, really scared. Of course, we used to do little things like launch TCP, you know, torpedoes out of conferences. I, it, somebody did at the company. Anyway, so but it was kind of an interesting, um, you know, introduction. Now, I'm not a security expert. I've been affected by these things, as I think we all have been, right? So this is kind of, as I start thinking about embedded systems, and now that I'm working in embedded systems, it's kind of cool for me to think about how a lot of very inexpensive systems are a lot like that washing machine over there that, that uh, had 12 meg of memory on it, would run about a VAX MIP, although it's much more affordable now and connected to the network, right? We have 32-bit and now 64-bit, very inexpensive, very powerful systems connected to the internet that we're using everywhere. And that's very exciting to think about. It's also, every time I think about cool applications, I start getting kind of worried about it. I start thinking, well, there's, there's a few uh, interesting privacy and security 
uh, implications to some of these things. I want to uh, revisit a few of these things that are, that are keeping me awake at night. Um, you know, one of these, uh, and, and I've, I, I'm very grateful to uh, Ryan Ware, who's a co-worker worker who uh, spent a very little time, dug out a few recent examples. But this should just kind of give you an idea. A lot of people heard about Stuxnet uh, virus, which affected a lot of Windows-based computers. Um, it turns out it's now known that this was actually developed by a number of American and Israeli intelligence officers intending to attack the nuclear program at uh, Iran. So they were working on you know, nuclear uh, fuel uh, refinement. And so the idea of Stuxnet was to go and attack the high-speed centrifuges, have them run at such a high speed that they would break. A difficult problem, given that all the computers connected to those centrifuges were separated by an air gap from the rest of, of the network, the rest of the world. But somehow they got the virus, they were successful, but then Stuxnet got out and then started affecting computers all over the world. Right? So the unintended consequences certainly is, uh, is kind of an issue with some of these things. In fact, what Stuxnet depended on was this so-called zero-day uh, issue. Right? And um, you know, I always was confused by the name, but all it means is every time you, you ship software, it's got some number of, of uh, holes in there that you don't know about. And that, um, maybe somebody knows about, but maybe are left there to, to be discovered. Um, Linux itself, uh, Ryan tells me that's on average about 2.5 CVEs per week get released on the Linux kernel, right? That a CVE is one of these, uh, uh, I can't remember what it stands for. It's basically a security exploit that needs to get patched. Um, that doesn't mean that Linux is, is insecure, is, is worse. It just means you have millions of people using Linux and a lot of eyes looking at the source code and probably revealing a lot of problems that are already there. Reality is that uh, studies are, are now uh, uh, you know, producing a, you know, reality. There are a lot more of these zero-day bugs than we ever uh, realize, and they are considerably serious. Here's another uh, example he dug out. This is a company uh, that has software that's actually used in a lot of um, power plants. And these power, this power plant software actually is, uh, you know, it's essentially a, a panel that you can use to, to uh, control these, uh, this critical infrastructure. Right? And uh, it turns out it's very easy to get onto this software, get a you know, root privilege and uh, you know, exploit it. And it turns out, somebody did, for this article on Ars Technica, they did a, a little uh, simple study, found 172 of these actually connected to the public internet. And that was just a cursory search. So in fact, um, you know, and, and the companies basically said, I, I don't, you know, I can hardly blame them. They sort of said, you know, we can't, we can't you know, solve all of these problems with our software. Right, so we have, consider yourself you know, part of an infrastructure now, dependent on an infrastructure for your lives, uh, really for power, I think about people in hospitals and things of that sort, but you know, that are all based on this infrastructure that, well, you know, there's some things we just can't deal with, right? So this, this kind of keeps me awake at night a little bit, thinking about all the power of embedded Linux and all the opportunity, unfortunately, that's there uh, for some of these bad things to happen. So um, now, I, I gotta tell you, um, sometimes you know, history just, uh, does funny things to you. Yesterday, New York Times, just as an example, uh, was great, they put out an article. Did anyone see this article that, that apparently there's governments fighting against governments? It's always kind of this funny spy versus spy things, but it turns out that you know, some release happened in the New York Times, some report that said there's this building in Shanghai that apparently is full of people that are you know, creating a lot of these viruses. So I'm not blaming you know, China. I think you know, there's a lot of countries that are probably doing this. It just happened to be this one was reported in the New York Times yesterday. So, this sort of thing, uh, you know, is happening constantly. And, uh, you know, oh, well, let, let, me, let me talk about a couple other examples. Uh, Jim Zimlin last year did a, I, I really appreciate his uh, keynote a year ago at the Yocto Project Developer Day. He gave just, he knocked it out of the park. It was a great keynote. And one of the things he talked about was, you know, these utilities that are now putting these sensors on to every, every house, right, to monitor the power use every 15 minutes at houses. So, they, so that smart grids right, can get a, a really good idea how much power is needed. Um, problem is FBI has basically now said, uh, uh, gee, there's hundreds of millions of dollars for one US utility that basically has been lost because it's very easy to uh, exploit these. Apparently, a very easy exploit um, in this article was you take a big permanent magnet and you set it on top of the, uh, you know, that's not a very sophisticated attack, I grant you. But you know, that's, that, that's at least, that's the most, insi you know, um, simple, what we call redneck engineering. I heard somebody at the keynote on Monday talk about redneck engineering. That, that's, that's a good way to do it. But there are uh, uh, you know, costs that are associated with this. Um, yeah, a few years ago, there was an article came out about smart dust. These are also referred to as, as moats. 
So you have these now very, you know, again, my, my favorite first computer from 1980, you know, these 12 meg, uh, you know, systems that are now uh, projected uh, in the, the first quarter of the century to be about five cents. All right, so now there are plenty of applications that are very uh, cool to use these in. If you think about uh, pipes in which uh, caustic uh, liquids are being pumped in a lot of plants, very difficult to monitor these things uh, when the pipes are, are weakened and need to be replaced. And so uh, placing these in all sorts of, of uh, very uh, intricate and difficult to reach locations that are to mon that's just one sort of example you might use you know smart dust for so um, you know clearly we're going to be at the place where that vax you know that I used in 1980 um, you know is going to be available everywhere for five cents a bit so five cents per unit now here's the problem I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing but but guess what I think a lot of embedded devices a lot of us make the sort of assumption is this is not a general purpose computer I don't really need to worry about um, any random application being loaded on this thing, it's a one application thing, right? So why do I have to worry about this? The problem, I think, is I've, I've you know, um, really grown to appreciate people working in embedded software. Sometimes maybe that assumption leads you into some dangerous conclusions. It maybe leads you and maybe leads your manager to kind of drive you to, to release software maybe earlier than you'd think it might be ready, right? Let's get this thing out. Let's get time to market. Let's, you know, get going on this thing so we actually are able to make money. Um, so I think that's the intersection that I'm really kind of concerned about. I don't think actually Linux is all that uh, different. There's some other operating systems that, uh, you know, people are actually measuring the number of exploits. Here's a general purpose operating system I won't, you know, I, I think is a great operating system, but there's also, you know, plenty of, uh, you know, exploits going there as well. So telling you all this and telling you this stuff keeps me awake doesn't make me want to uh, be known as uh, uh, this person. Uh, you know, uh, Cassandra is, uh, was known as, uh, she was in Greek mythology, uh, she was uh, doomed uh, to uh, ever know the future, but be cursed that no one would ever believe her. And so there's a picture of her from Wikipedia in front of a burning city and driving her mad because no one would ever believe her. I don't want to be like that. I'm not, just like I said, I'm not a security person per se, but what I can see is there is a social um, imperative that I think we as, as citizens of this world need to think about this sort of thing and try to get a handle on it so that we can prevent uh, the world really from losing um, a lot of, uh, you know, not only time and money, but people's lives potentially can be at risk of this sort of thing. That's the last thing I want to have happen is embedded Linux being uh, blamed on the front of, you know, name your favorite newspaper, Wall Street Journal or what have you to say, um, you know, is the cause of loss of life or uh, uh, great expense. And so what are some of the things that we could do? What are some of the things I can do? I mean, I'm working on the Octo Project, and if you haven't heard of the Octo Project, I strongly encourage you to learn more about it. What we're trying to do is, with the whole world of embedded Linux, really help everybody, from the silicon vendors, to the embedded OSVs, to the device makers, to the entire open source community, and really get a single and universal way that everyone is developing set of tools uh, for embedded Linux. That's an awfully high goal. Right? But I think it's kind of worth it if you kind of think about what are the, the potential social impact if we can do some things right. It's not just making it easier to create embedded devices. It's not just, it's not just making it so that you spend less time screwing around with different BSP formats or different, you know, oh, I can't, you know, hack this thing because it didn't work, you know, work before and man, I have to hack it up again. It's not about that. It's a really, I think about can we, as a community, come together and really do some great things in this area. So. Um, as an engineering manager, I work with the community in the Octo project. This is a few things that, that we're working on in our current you know, release. We release every six months. Our, si our sixth release is coming up in April. And uh, you know, here's a, a, an example of some of the things that are important. You know, if you have 2.5 CVEs per week on average with the Linux kernel, it says that it's probably a really good idea to have a robust updater available, right? In other words, as the security issues are found, you need to be able to update those connected things. Now, as my friends at Wind River used to tell me all the time, customers always want the latest thing, but they don't want it to change. Uh, how does that work? Yeah. So, you know, and it's true. Certainly in the enterprise area, if you've got a bunch of, you know, uh, embedded sensors every place, um, one of the last things you want to have happen is that an update to go out and to brick the system, right? So then you have to go visit it, right? So this is where um, I'm very... Uh, you know, happy that we're going to at least contribute, I think, to this. In our upcoming release, our intent is to have uh, a new updater available, along with, we also have the package-based updaters like uh, for RPM Deb and um, O Package. So we all, we'll, we'll continue to have those, uh, but we're adding a new updater that was developed by Arjen Vandeven and his uh, 
a project called Fenris, and that says www.fenris.org. It's actually, I got that wrong, it's linux.fenris.org if you want to go visit his website. So um, we're working with him to try and incorporate that as a, um, as, as a feature. I got to tell you, though, a robust firmware updater is probably needed as well. And it's a little bit more difficult to do that. What's below the kernel is typically very device dependent, very difficult to do as a sort of a general open source uh, solution. So um, we're hoping that we can uh, you know, get some best practices out there as well. So uh, there are some people doing some interesting things, I think, I've heard of with UEFI, as an example, on some phones uh, and some other devices. But I think that's, that's still a, you know, the device specific part is, uh, is kind of the concern. Um, People usually say, oh, yeah, SE Linux, right? So um, in fact, I'm, I very much appreciate the, the uh, folks from Wind River contributing this to the Octo project. There is an SE Linux layer that you can apply. Um, that's the URL for the Git repository. Um, and I'm uh, extremely grateful to uh, Mark Hatley and his other uh, folks from Wind River for contributing this and maintaining it. Um, and so you know, SE Linux gives you, makes sure that you can say, well, what are the, the least privileged, you know, that, that example of uh, Beck's vi or the uh, guy's virus where he took advantage of somebody having the privilege to be able to, you know, uh, you know really have root privileges, it, it really tries to reduce that, that factor considerably. So um, we've been uh, interested in this concept with someone called tool chain armoring. In other words, there's some things that you can do in the tool chain to actually be able to you know, generate uh, you know, generate, sorry, generate virus, generate uh, executables that are much less uh, susceptible. We actually haven't uh, quite uh, uh, tested this yet, but it's something we're kind of looking at. If, if anyone from the community would like to work with us on this, we actually tried it out and found that we had problems with eglibc. So we're, we're trying to sort it out. So that's one of the examples. Hopefully, we'll have this in the upcoming release. Um, well, sc scanning for obvious holes or backdoors would be really good. There's a project called Bastille Linux that um, we've identified as uh, something that would actually scan for kind of obvious things like open uh, back doors and uh, um, you know, accounts with no password and things of that sort. Um, so um, we're looking at integrating this. One of the other things I'm kind of interested about is, is integrating that into WebHob. Um, this is something, uh, the name's a little odd, but basically a web-based uh, tool which will allow you to generate your Linux. By the way, one of the things that's kind of cool about it is even people who are sort of skeptical about web, I would call them I would call them UI skeptical people, right? Uh, give me a command line to build Linux, I'm fine with that, right? In fact, some of the tools that are going to be available, collected and visual and available, um, so you can see. Well, where's the you know where's the space disappearing? Why why do I, is my footprint so big? And actually identify things. Why is my build taking so long? Being able to analyze exactly what's going on there and some really good forensic information that'll help you uh, uh, figure out more about what's going on. We'll have that available uh, preliminary versions, hopefully in our 1.4 release. We're working on that with designers. By the way, on, on that, uh, will it go back? Wow, it does. Um, cool, you guys are great. Um, the, uh, the concept here, by the way, is, is we're trying not to do any of this in a vacuum. This is a true open source project. Um, we have a mailing list you can join. You can, um, the, the, we, we are working with some, uh, a very, uh, very good uh, um, industrial designer who's working with us on this. She would love to get you know, your feedback and involvement in terms of some of this stuff. In fact, we have a prototype of this. We'd love to get your feedback on the Octo Project booth. Um, and then, you know, there's some other uh, places we could use your help. I mean, one of the things that's great about not only having the tools available uh, that run on, by the way, ARM, PowerPC, MIPS, and x86, the, all of these, uh, all the main embedded architectures are supported. Um, and we have some starting points as well. Uh, Web Kiosk is an example where you can, you know, start with any of those architectures, but um, add a layer that will basically give you an HTML5 uh, web application, basically, without any kind of decoration. Right? So, you know, typical kind of thing you'd want to have for a kiosk. Um, we'd love to have your help on that. Actually, there's a, a talk today. Nitin Campbell is giving a talk Friday, 2.15. Uh, you know, how to build your own digital signage solution with the Octo Project. Anyway, that, he's going to be talking a little bit about that meta web kiosk uh, layer. So um, that's one of the uh, starting points. But I'd love to get help from the community. We all would to say, what are the potential security uh, issues here? What are some of the places where we could kind of improve the software? Um, another starting point is with virtualization. We have some people who are actually using the Octo project to create little virtual appliances, things that might be Zen guests or uh, you know, KVM guests or what have you, just minimalized for, for one specific function. Um, love to get your uh, feedback on how to, you know, are there any security, potential security issues there so that we can really make this a great starting point for the community. Um, there are a couple of others, Meta Multimedia, and uh, Baryon is uh, one of the first ones of these we did. It's a, it's a NAS device. 
right? Network, network attached storage. So you can use Varions as a starting point to build a NAS. Very nice to be able to do that kind of thing. But again, we haven't necessarily done much work um, as a community yet to, to make sure there aren't any other you know, uh, vir you know, potential backdoors in there. So we'd love you know, your help as a community to help us with that. So um, you know, there's also Intel. I mean, I, I am paid by Intel. Uh, they write my paycheck, so I'm, I'm delighted to, to work for Intel. And there's some things that Intel is actually building into hardware to try and help with this uh, matter as well. Um, and uh, some of the things we're trying to you know, enable in the Octo project is uh, also. One of the technologies is something called TXT. Um, it's trusted execution technology. Let me kind of explain how this more or less works is that you know, if you are running a, an embedded device that maybe is running using virtualization, maybe you have a couple of different virtual machines running, or even a bare metal kernel, the challenge is uh, someone may have stuck some bad code into that kernel and uh, the operating system, and when it boots up again, and you don't know that it's been changed. Or they infected the VMM, right? And so um, people have been, you know, do things with, with uh, uh, what they call a root of trust. And so the opportunity here is actually, if you have thousands of systems, right, all over the, the world and the Internet of Things, how do you ensure that, that no one's messed with that, uh, uh, you know, the operating system or the VMM that might be running on it? So, um, there's an open source a project called T-Boot that um, uh, basically has been adopted not only uh, for the Octo project, but also for uh, uh, Fedora and Ubuntu and Suzy, et cetera. How it basically works is that um, the system actually measures the launch of the, OS of the OS or the VMM, right? Measures that launch and then compares that measurement to a previous one that was saved in the TPM in the platform. If the measurements match, you're good to go. Basically, no one's messed with it. If the measurements don't match, it means something has changed, and so it uses TXT to basically go into a backup mode. Backup mode is depends on whatever, whatever it is you want it to be. VMware actually, uh, uh, I think, allows you not to decrypt the disk because it encrypts all the storage. Um, you know, there are other sort of uh, backup modes you can use, like don't boot, or right? don't out give access to the internet, or something like that. So. Um, uh, and, and then the other piece of this, besides you know, the, the measured launch, is that you need the ability to actually see with a cloud of uh, you know, internet devices, a cloud of these connected intelligent devices, you need, you'd like to be able to say from the central point which ones actually um, came up OK and which ones didn't. So we actually have an open source remote attestation stack that allows you to basically query the systems in a secure sort of way that basically allows you to inter interpret with this cloud of embedded devices out there, which ones actually uh, might have had a problem, might have been infected. So, so remotely, very quickly, an enterprise can figure out, oh, and this cloud of, you know, let's say it's the digital signs in all of the McDonald's restaurants in the world, one of the projects we were working on with the Octo project, or you know, all of the you know, digital signs in the San Francisco airport. Mm, I think they're probably running Windows, but anyway. Um, you know, this gives you, well, that was Stuxnet was based on a Windows virus. But anyway, this get, would give you at a central point to be able to determine in a very uh, provable sort of way that you actually uh, can be trusted or not. And this is not everything. This is one piece of the puzzle. But I think it's, it's kind of cool to think about the hardware actually locking in you know, the security, basically. And for people who you know, care enough about this to say, yeah, I, I really want to make sure the integrity is, is, uh, is guaranteed by hardware, this is, this is a great capability. And it's, you know, the software is open source. It's open source projects. And so, um, so what else? So finally, final word is, I'd say, you know, join us. Um, we actually would love to get more uh, involvement with the Octo project. We are, already have great involvement from, uh, again, silicon suppliers, OSVs, device makers, and the open source community. Um, and we have a number of talks here at ELC that are, uh, you know, either touch on the Octo project in some way or some part of it. Um, today, actually, starting at noon, the uh, Kuhn's going to be talking about the open embedded project two years after adopting Yocto. Uh, at 2 p.m. we have uh, somebody from the LTSI uh, uh, effort with the Linux Foundation. Very happy to have them part of the Yocto Project Advisory Board. So I can talk about uh, how to um, use LTSI with Yocto. Um, then uh, Sean from Minter Graphics, one of those uh, uh, members of the community, members of the advisory board, they're an OSV. Um, he's going to talk about uh, building custom Linux distribution with the Yocto Project. Um, Scott Garman at 4 p.m. this afternoon is going to be giving a very interesting and exciting talk that's probably much more interesting than the title, but we made it sort of actually kind of boring. There's a really kind of a very cool announcement that's going to happen in that talk, so I can't, I can't spoil it, oh! but it's going to be very, very cool. So anyway, go to the, uh, 
And then this afternoon we have a boff at uh, 5.30, 5.50, something like that. Um, then uh, tomorrow there's a, a talk from Dennis from TI, um, also a, a, a strong part of our, our cooperative effort here on pre-built binary tool chains. Tracy and Nithya uh, are going to be talking about marketing, which I think is, you know, very, it's a very good talk. I, I uh, attended a version of this. They, they, they do a, a kick-butt job on marketing uh, open source projects. And so um, uh, then at uh, 13.45, which uh, that's uh, 1.45, there's uh, Chris Simmons, si Simons or Simmons? I keep forgetting. Simons, okay. It's going to give a, a talk that is really, um, it's not specifically about Yocto, but it has a Yocto project as one of the components in it. And I'm very excited. It's a, it's a great talk. It's very, very cool. And then if you want a general overview of the Yocto project, what's there, Saul is going to be talking at 4 p.m. tomorrow, um, giving a, just a general overview. And then Friday, there are a few more, talking about um, uh, from uh, Michael from Enea is going to be talking about meta virtualization. Um, Kem is going to be talking about EG libc and bringing kconfig to it. Kem is a, is a contributor to the project. He's going to be talking about uh, EG libc, which is part of the project. And then Nitin is giving that digital signage talk. And then finally, Mark and Mark from Wind River are going to be talking about licensing. So that's all I had. Thank you all very much. <laughs>